In this section, we'll look at Truman's initial actions in 1946 and 1947. One of the first flashpoints of the new Cold War was in 1946 over oil-rich Iran. In 1942, during World War II, Iran signed an agreement by which Allied troops would enter its country to protect its oil fields from the Nazis. The countries would have to leave within six months at the end of the war. The Soviets were not part of the agreement, but as the war came to a close, they feared the Western Allies would retain control over Iranian oil and they would be denied any concessions. Accordingly, the Soviets entered Iran claiming that they were assisting a prosecuted rebel group in the north. The U.S. complained to the new United Nations, and when the deadline for the withdrawal of all Allied forces had passed, a clearly a crisis had developed. The crisis appeared to be over, however, when the Iranian government reached an agreement to give the Soviets at least some concessions, and the Soviets did in fact withdraw. As soon as the Soviets were out, however, the Iranians reneged on their agreement, and at the urging of Truman and with uh, U.S. aid, the Iran then crushed the remaining Soviet-backed rebels in the north. The Soviets were furious, but refrained from reintroducing their troops back into Iran. In a sense, therefore, the U.S. had kind of won, and uh, a western oriented government in Iran stood. As the Iran crisis unfolded, Stalin gave a speech in which he declared that as long as capitalism survived, the Soviets would have to stay prepared for war. Supreme Court Justice William Douglas called the speech, quote, the declaration of World War III. A month after Stalin's speech, ex-British Prime Minister Winston Churchill gave another famous speech to a college in Fulton, Missouri. He said, quote, from Stedeling in the Baltic to Trieste in the Adriatic, an iron curtain has descended across the European continent, unquote. It was the first time anyone had used the phrase iron curtain, which the press quickly picked up. Churchill said God had willed Anglo-American monopoly of the atomic bomb. Loan payments, meanwhile, and trade uh, talks began to break down in the summer of 1946 as the Cold War unfolded. With tensions obviously increasing, the United States still, officially at least, promised to share the technology of the atomic bomb with the international community, a promise made at the end of World War II. Just after the Iranian crisis in 1946 and the Churchill speech, the United States outlined regulations and specific requirements necessary for it to share the technology. One of the requirements would be an American veto of peaceful uses of nuclear power. The Soviets or others Americans insisted would have no veto or inspection power. This angered the Soviets who refused. Uh, the result was the Americans didn't share their technology and the Soviets rushed to develop their own bomb. By early 1947, Washington worried that much of the world appeared unstable. Britain, who had uh, provided stability in its colonies in such places as India and Palestine, appeared unable after World War II to continue its role. Nationalist anti-colonial movements spread, and the United States worried that uh, communists would, would take advantage of all the instability. For example, uh, Turkey was in tremendous under tremendous pressure from Russia to give uh, territorial concessions. Uh, to allow it passage through the Dardanelles and into the eastern Mediterranean. Meanwhile, uh, there was a civil war in Greece that clearly had uh, connections to Soviet expansionism. A, uh, in Greece, a, a popular but communist-controlled guerrilla movement had the upper hand early in 1947. The British had supported a rightist-leaning Greek government since late 1944, but uh, it was in a protracted and bloody effort to suppress the communist-led partisan group known as EAM. Anyway, the British ambassador informed Washington in February 1947 that Great Britain would have to withdraw entirely from Greece. It couldn't maintain up its, its struggle. Truman's response to the end of British power in the eastern Mediterranean kind of marked a fateful turning point in American foreign policy. The implications seemed clear enough, as Truman said. If Greece was lost, Turkey had become an, un in an, an untenable outpost in a sea of communism. Similarly, if Turkey yielded to Soviet demands, the position of Greece would be extremely endangered. So Truman uh, met with congressional leaders and eventually went to Capitol Hill on March 12th and sought $400 million for military assistance to Greece and Turkey. 
even more important than the appropriations request was Truman's enunciation of the so-called Truman Doctrine. It went way beyond Kennan's concept. American foreign policy, Truman said, should support, quote, free peoples who are resisting attempted subjugation by armed minorities or by outside pressures. Quote, if we falter in our leadership, we may endanger the peace of the world or we shall surely endanger the welfare of our own nation. It was quite a uh, contrast of uh, the isolationism before World War II. The U.S. was saying that it was its, its job to help free peoples who were facing armed rebellion in, their, in its midst. That, that's uh, kind of the opposite of isolationism. As winter turned into spring in 1947, it seemed that the greco turkish situation was really kind of just a symptom of a more momentous crisis that threatened all of non-communist Europe. To a varying degree, Britain, France, Italy, and other nations of Western Europe were staggering under nearly impossible burdens of reconstruction. Their nations had been destroyed, and repairing them cost a lot of money. Careening from one economic crisis to another, they faced the grim prospect of violent social upheaval if, if they failed to accomplish virtual miracles of recovery. Accordingly, in an address at Harvard University in June, Secretary uh, of State George Marshall embraced suggestions made by Kennan and the policy planning staff of the State Department. The European governments, he declared, should work out a, a comprehensive reconstruction program and tell the U.S. how it might best help them to achieve lasting recovery. Any government willing to assist in the task of reconstruction, he promised, will find full cooperation on a part of the United States. This aid package became known as the Marshall Plan. What the Secretary envisioned was nothing less than the, the rebuilding of the Western European economy and social order. The idea was that communism spreads when people are miserable. When people have property and are affluent, communism is less likely to spread. Now, although Marshall didn't exclude the Soviet bloc from the offer of American aid, he knew that the Russian rejection was, was very likely. Indeed, when the British, French, and Russian foreign ministers met in Paris in late June to consider a reply, the British and French ministers voiced their overwhelming enthusiasm and gratitude of Western Europe. But uh, Molotov, the Russian minister, expressed the opposition of the communist bloc and left the meeting when he couldn't disrupt it. The uh, result was eventually uh, the Committee on Economic European Economic Cooperation. Uh, the the European countries requested over $22 billion. The uh, Committee of European Economic Cooperation got an initial budget of $5 billion, but over the following three years, an additional $12 billion in uh, loans went to uh, Europe. Sixteen nations ended up getting money, uh, but most, the most nations, the nations that got the most were Great Britain and, and France and uh, the Western Germany section. But overall, the Marshall Plan was really one of the most successful foreign policy programs in American history. It forged a, a permanent link between the United States and Western Europe. But more importantly, it brought a, a new period of economic prosperity and political stability to the American allies and uh, thus, you know, filled its chief objective, presented, preventing communist electoral successes and the further expansion of Soviet influence. By 1950, it was clear that the Marshall Plan was providing a, a strong stimulus to economic growth. From 1947 through 1950, the GNP and Marshall Plan countries as a whole increased 25%. Industrial production went up 64%, and agricultural output up 24%. Uh, in most categories, recovery not only attained, but exceeded pre-war levels. In this picture, you can see uh, a town in western Germany uh, after World War II was completely bombed out, just shells of buildings. But on the right, only eight years later, all the Marshall Plan money had allowed it to be completely rebuilt. Relations between the West and the Soviet Union continued to deteriorate throughout 1947. The Soviet Union created the Communist Information Bureau, the first official body of the international communist movement since the last meeting of the Comintern prior to World War II. Known as the Common Form, the new body pushed communist propaganda, especially in its new Eastern sat European satellites. In these Eastern European countries themselves, the Soviets cracked down. In Hungary, the Soviets abolished all anti-communist parties. and. Uh, you know, expelled its their their leaders. 
in uh, Czechoslovakia, the Soviets actually murdered opposition leaders, eventually staging a coup in late 1947 and into 1948 that reinstated a more Soviet-friendly government. As the Soviets flex their muscles in Eastern Europe, Truman and Congress realized that the structure and organization of America's military and diplomatic corps was redundant and inefficient. It wasn't well suited to the strong control of a vast worldwide presence. Beyond this general agreement, however, there was tremendous inter-service competition, fearing that a more centralized diplomatic and military structure might weaken one's own position. Now, after considerable debate, therefore, Congress ended up passing and, and Truman signed the uh, critical National Security Act of 1947 in July 1947. Its purpose was to better guide and control worldwide containment. The National Security Act of 1947 united all the military branches under a single defense department, headed by a civilian secretary who had cabinet rank. He would supervise sub-cabinet level civilian secretaries of the Army, Navy, and Air Force. To assure that the uniformed officers coordinated specific strategies, the Act created the permanent Joint Chiefs of Staff, with representatives of all three service branches. One of the generals or admirals was appointed chairman of the Joint Chiefs and was, therefore, the single highest ranking uniformed military officer in the United States. To ensure more coordinated spy operations, the Act created the Central Intelligence Agency, the CIA, which reduced redundancy from previous intelligence services. Finally, the Act created the National Security Council, an advisory body of experts who could analyze, interpret, and make recommendations of the intelligence the U.S. acquired. All of this organization, of course, remains in effect today. This includes the section on Truman's actions uh, early in the Cold War, 1946 to 47.